All right, then. I see that it's 12.02. Uh, we're just passing the 350 participant right now, and we will just get started. So welcome, everyone. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Anthony Quinn. I'm the Chief Community Officer at CARP. My role is to support our members and our volunteer CARP chapters across the country as they advocate locally in their own communities for the issues that are most important to Canadians as we age. We've assembled a great panel for you this morning or this afternoon, and we're talking about falls prevention. November is falls prevention month, and I welcome you all to our webinar. We've started a national program of webinars due to the inability of our chapters to meet locally. Our chapters continue to host virtual meetings and some are able to meet in person, but we're trying to get a number of important topics to you on uh, national webinars and we're glad that you've joined us today. And we invite you to join us for upcoming webinars. Stay tuned for future invitations. My duty today is to act as the technical producer of this meeting. I'm not the expert in falls preventions, but we have a great panel. And I'm going to introduce you first to Nancy Edwards. And Nancy is a volunteer with the CARP office in, or the CARP chapter in Ottawa. And I've known uh, Nancy for a number of years now, and she has been particularly uh, uh, active on the file for falls prevention. Now, one of the benefits of CARP uh, is the strength of our volunteers. And I wasn't familiar with, with Nancy's, Nancy's bio until she shared it with me recently. And, and I could tell you, uh, this is the strength of, of CARP's chapters. The volunteers that we have in our chap chapter network is, is tremendous. So, so thank you, Nancy. Uh, and looking at Nancy's bio here, Nancy is an RN. She's a PhD, and she's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. She's a distinguished professor at the University of Ottawa and a professor emerita at the School of Nursing. Uh, she obtained her undergraduate nursing degree from the University of Windsor and completed graduate studies in epidemiology at McMaster and McGill. She's a clinical research, her, excuse me, her clinical research interests in the fields of public and population health. She has worked in the field of fall prevention for nearly 30 years. She's currently a board member with the CARP Ottawa chapter and with the Family Council of, Councils of Ontario. She's a member of the Housing and Small Building Technical Review Committee for the National Research Council. Nancy, that's quite a bio. Uh, thank you for, for joining us on this panel today as our one of our experts. Uh, I'll tell you that Nancy did uh, come uh, put a series of fall prevention webinars on last year through the Ottawa chapter, which are now shared on our website, but we're glad to have this uh, national audience for you today. So welcome, Nancy. Well, thanks very much, Anthony, and welcome to everybody. I see we're people coming in from coast to coast and just want to send out, um, you know, our, our sadness about what's happened in British Columbia. I know it's a very trying times for you. So we hope that that situation resolves itself in, in short order, but it looks like we're in it for the long haul. So I have um, the pleasure of introducing my two other panelists and I'll do that. And, and perhaps while I'm doing that, Anthony will put up our first uh, couple of polling questions, but you'll see um, Dory Cran has joined us. Um, I actually met Dory through Saskatchewan's CARP chapter because they're getting involved in fall prevention as well. And Dory's in her 13th year with the Saskatoon Fire Department. Among her primary responsibilities are the Remembering When program, which we'll hear more about in a few minutes, uh, fire safety education, and representing the department in the community. Dory describes her parents who are both in their 90s, my mom is in her 90s too, Dory, um, as a driving force in her desire to help older adults live safely at home, so welcome. Um, and our second uh, panelist is Stephanie Cowell, and Stephanie has spent more than a decade working in the area of injury and trauma prevention. She's the Director of Knowledge Translation at Parachute, and she'll tell you more about that organization in a few minutes. She leads the analysis and synthesis of research to develop Parachute's evidence-based solutions that they use to help them determine what to advocate around and, and what education is needed. She's uh, been a speaker at many conferences and workshops, and you may have heard her on the news because she's a media spokesman as well for injury prevention topics and public policy issues. So I'm just really pleased that both of you were able to join us today. We've put up um, a polling question there, um, which we would ask everybody to answer. 
Um, and uh, we'll have a look at the results in a moment. Uh, and then I think there's a second question we're going to put up in a couple of minutes as well. But the first one is whether or not you've experienced a fall, whether indoors or outdoors in the past year. And your, your uh, comments are anonymous, so we won't know who's had the fall and who hasn't. <laughs> I can tell you right off the bat, I have had a fall in the last year. Fortunately, without too many injuries, but it did hurt my, um, my ego for a bit because I was skiing at the time. So... Anthony, are we able to show the results? You bet. So oh, there just... we go, 42%. So that's right in line with the statistics I'll show you in a moment. Um, and uh, perhaps you can put up our second question. And this is where we're asking you whether or not you think that the incidence of falls in Canada is on the increase decreasing or staying about the same. So again, just uh, put in your answer there and we'll take a look at the responses and then we'll get on with the, uh, with the presentation. Anthony, you're able to gauge when most people have answered. Yeah, we're just about 70% of them already. So. Terrific, wow, this group is fast. Yeah. And I see we have almost 450 participants. That's just amazing. And we've got a trend. It's definitely on the increasing side. It does. Okay. For, for time, I will end the poll and thank everyone for, for their participation Super. in that and one. And I'll share the results. Yeah, there we go. 71% think it's increasing. Okay. And they're right. I'll show you more in a, in a second. So let me uh, share my screen here. Fingers crossed this all works. Anthony, you're closing that, okay. See if I can get this to uh, go from the beginning. There we are. So uh, let me just start out with some, some numbers and a bit of data. I think that helps to sort of situate the problem. And, and I must say, although I've been working in this field for um, over 30 years now, I'm still astounded at the numbers. Uh, one in three older adults fall annually. So that I think is very much in line with the responses that we just saw. Uh, in a single year, if we take into account all age groups, we see about 654,000 emergency department visits for injuries that resulted from an unintentional fall uh, and a large number of hospital stays. It's important um, that we think about this, not just as a problem among older adults, this is a problem for all age groups. And many of the, the um, suggestions and so on that we have make uh, things safer for everybody, not just for older adults, but we'll emphasize a little bit more in the older adult side of things. We know that those who are hospitalized for falls are more likely to stay longer than those hospitalized for other reasons. And we also know that about 71% um, of hospital stays resulting from falls occur among those age 65 and older. So you can see there's a disproportionate number of more serious injuries among older adults. The problem is getting worse. So those of you who answered that question as, uh, correctly will uh, we'll see what's going on here. Um, we know that from about 2015 to 2018, there was a 9% uh, increase uh, in hospitalizations for seniors. And I should just mention here that the numbers that we see from emergency room departments and hospitalization are very important. Um, and Stephanie's gonna talk a bit more about those, but that really is a big, big underestimate of the actual problem because we think that only about one in 13 falls actually get reported. Partly that's because some falls don't result in injuries that warrant emergency room department visits. Some of it is because actually probably people should have gone to emerge, but they didn't want to wait. <laughs> um, they were embarrassed. Um, they've decided not to say anything to their family physician about their fall. So we're we, these numbers just tell us the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, and we see a similar pattern in the US. I'm just demonstrating this, uh, showing you that the fall death rate in the US increased over a 10 year period by about 30%. Um, so this is pretty startling. What's going on? Well, there's risk factors for falls. And of course, as we age, we may be more likely to have some of these risk factors. So an aging population 
is explaining part, but not all of the problem. Um, these are the risk factors that we know very well from evidence. We know that if you're on four or more medications, and that is both prescription and over-the-counter medications, that you're more likely to have a fall. If you're taking benzodiazepine sedative hypnotics, which are sometimes prescribed if you're having a lot of trouble sleeping, um, those by themselves are a risk factor. Peripheral neuropathy, you might experience that with uh, tingling or pain in your lower limbs. Um, diabetes, for example, is a, a condition that often leads to some peripheral neuropathy, but it interferes with your ability to perceive your footing on the ground. And so it affects your balance, both directly and indirectly. Other gait and balance impairments due to a whole myriad of factors are risk factors. Could be that your gait has changed due to um, arthritis. Uh, your gait has changed because of uh, a recent fall that you've had and you've got a sprained um, ankle. Um, a balance impairment, again, due to various factors. A history of falls in the past six to 12 months put you, puts you at higher risk for a fall in the future. Vision changes, and among seniors, we're often thinking about you know, cataracts, which I have, which mean that you're getting less light into your eyes glaucoma, um, which starts to affect your peripheral vision, or macular degeneration, which is less common, but also affects your, your visual, visual field. And increasing age by itself is also a risk factor. Falls are often multifactorial, and I'm gonna emphasize this quite a bit because the environment's implicated in about one third of all falls in seniors. And about 50 to 60% of all falls occur um, indoors and um, often in your own home, so often in a familiar environment. Here's a slide that shows uh, the increasing incidence in falls. This happens to come from the US, um, but we see very similar patterns in Canada. This is a, a solid line here, which shows the increasing incidence with age in females and a slightly lower uh, rate of falls among males. These again are just emergency department visits. But what you see is that those numbers really take off um, when people um, get into their 60s. That's a, an exponential increase in the rate of uh, visits that we're seeing. And falls have a big uh, human cost. That there's that initial emotional response of, you know, you've, down you go and you're just kind of feeling bad, badly about it and maybe a bit embarrassed and, and worried. Um, there may be a loss of independence that starts to accompany uh, a fall. Uh, you lose your confidence, you know, can I actually navigate around um, my home, my community safely? You may start to become afraid of falling. And when we become afraid of falling, then that can actually make us restrict our mobility more, which increases our risk factors for falls and increases our risk for falling. So some people get into a real downward spiral effect that happens from a single fall. Why does it matter? Well, I think we all want to maintain our independence. We all want to experience a good quality of life um, in our older, well, throughout our life. Um, and most can Canadian seniors want to age in place. We have seen um, changes uh, in patterns of falls. Uh, on the left there, you'll see the uh, data from British Columbia showing that increase uh, risk of hospitalization from falls as people get older and, and over time. Um, what I wanna contrast it with is what's going on with motor vehicle accidents. And Stephanie, I tried to change that word accidents. <laughs> um, Stephanie uh, wants us, and I think all safety experts say we should be using collisions and crashes because accidents is this notion of it's gonna happen, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, Crashes and collisions, we've managed to do a lot about it. Look at this huge reduction in both fatalities and serious injuries that has occurred over the same time period. So we're really lagging on the falls problem compared to what we've been able to do in the motor vehicle sector. And I think part of this is because we're um, dealing with some myths that many of us hold in in various ways. So on the left are the myths related to falls and on the right are myths related to motor vehicle uh, crashes. On falls, I, well, I know where the hazards are in my home, I can avoid them. Um, on the right, I know where the potholes are, I can drive around them. 
falls, I don't need bathroom grab bars yet. And a motor vehicle uh, crashes, I don't need seat belts yet. Falls are inevitable. inevitable, they can't be prevented. Pedestrian accidents are inevitable, they can't be prevented. Making my home more accessible will give it an institutional look. Making our streets safer will make our neighborhood look unfriendly. And I would say that we basically debunked all of those um, road traffic collision myths, but we're quite a long ways from debunking them um, when it comes to falls. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dory uh, because she's a, a first responder. She's on the front lines and Dory, what does this look like on the front lines? And I think we were going to put up another poll here, Anthony, if you would. Um, this is about uh, firefighters. So firefighters have an important role to play in the prevention of falls. Do you agree, disagree, or you're not sure? And just to give you a fair warning, we have two more polls still to come. <laughs> you might guess at the right answer here because I've got Dory on the panel. <laughs> Anthony, are the numbers coming in from our yeah, friend? Yeah, we're about 50-54, agree and not sure. Okay, there we go. All right, so Dory, you got your work cut out. <laughs> okay, I'm good for it. So let All me right. See if yep. I can get this to advance. Oh, my, my PowerPoint, there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Nancy, for this opportunity to present here this, this morning for me. I so appreciate that. I know that some of you might not be as intimately um, connected to Saskatoon as I am, so I just wanted to let you know a few of the statistics about our city. For starters, we have 331,000 people approximately. About 70% of us own our own home and 13% are 65 years and older. Next slide. So, and I, as Nancy said, I work for the fire department. So what does that look like? And what does uh, it look like for us? So most fire departments actually have um, correspond with the number of people that they serve. So in Saskatoon, we have 330 staff of those 280 are firefighters. And this also our management as well as our emergency measures operations, our inspectors, our dispatchers, maintenance and mechanical, and the division that I work in, which is actually community relations. So next slide. So why does the fire department actually have lived experience when it comes to fall prevention? All of the Saskatoon fire, at the Saskatoon Fire Department, as in many others, our firefighters are primary care paramedics, and they respond to all emergency, life-threatening medical emergencies. We also respond to what we call lift assist, and that's when someone has fallen and is unable to get up. So when we respond to those emergencies, we're going to first do an assessment of them and make sure that it's um, safe to lift them. Then we'll lift them, and after that, we'll take vital stats from them just to make sure that they don't need medical, more medical care. And if they do, we'll facilitate that as well. So when the fire department comes in, often we are the first people to find them after they've fallen. And we are also the ones, because we're in their home, to be able to understand the gravity of the situation. And Dory, so, is there an example that stands out in your mind of, of uh, somebody who has, you know, needed a lift assist? Oh, you know what? Well, last year we did 1,150 of them. Wow. So, so we have so many examples, but you know, there's people that just need one at the very, you know, they've, they've fallen and they haven't been able to get up or they fell in the bathtub or someplace um, like that. And we're there to, to help get them up. And it's so critical for them that they've got some alerting method. Either they can call us, their cell phone is closed, or they've got a personal alarm system, some way to let us know and get us uh, rolling to come and help them. I bet they're glad when you show up. <laughs> Usually, you know what? It's a pretty positive thing for, for us yes. to do. <laughs> so you can see that we've been lifting people for a long time, since 2007. And we've tried various ways to get them help and then turn to remembering when in 2017. So remembering when is my prime responsibility. You can see that over the years, we've lifted more and more people. 
once we established remembering when those lifts started to, to level off a little bit, but COVID hasn't done us any favors and they're, they're back up again. So during COVID, older adults have experienced many challenges and that has included falls. So next slide. And I thought you might be interested to know, just like Nancy said, that 78% of the people we lift are over 70. And um, you'll notice there's a really small percentage for under 49. And those happen to be um, usually people with complex medical conditions when we're, we're lifting them. Now Saskatchewan actually has one of the highest places in the world of MS per population. Mm -hmm. And so in, in Saskatchewan and in Saskatoon, a number of those people actually suffer from MS and it, they're part of that big picture for us as well. Next slide. So 86% of the people that we lift are lifted one or two times per year. So those are the people that think, you know what? Oh, this happened to me. I got to make sure it never happens again. And they take steps to, to prevent that. Or they're the people that think I'm going to be super duper careful and that's never going to happen again. Or else, you know, we also lift people who are palliative. And, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I've been called or had people call me up and say, you know what? He lifted my husband three times and he was able to die in his home like he wanted to. Mm. So you know what? It's a special privilege and an honor to be able to help people out in that way. So that is a small part of, of what we actually are seeing here today. Now, I can think of one couple and they were just a, actually a wonderful couple and good friends of mine by the end because we lifted them so many times. So they were in that part of that 5% group that we lifted multiple times. Um, they were both in their 90s. By the time they, they moved, they were 95 and 96. And we had been there so many times that the firefighters all knew the name of their puppy. So, um, but you know what? I have visited them multiple times and phoned them a lot of times. And they were so willing to, to make changes. And, to, you know, if we suggested that they might need a new bed, they got a new bed. If she fell in the bathroom and there was trouble getting into the tub, they got their tub modified. We got help in from the health authority and they just kept increasing the amount of the help that they were getting. The lifts continued though. And then one day she told me, you know what, we're moving. And we're moving to a place that has even more care. They had assisted living and they were moving to, to a place that, that provided more care. And you know what, I was sad to see them go because they'd become friends of ours because we'd interacted with them so many times. But at the same time, I was really happy that they actually were getting the help that they obviously needed. All right, let's move to the next slide. So let's turn to remembering when. And the goal of our program is make sure that everyone gets the help that they need before we lift them five times. So sometimes that's a confusing statement. We don't actually start giving people help after we've lifted them five times. We actually start at the very beginning or even before. Um, so we're trying to get them help as soon as we, we possibly can. But you know what? Sometimes we don't think we need help or sometimes we're not ready for help. And I know for me personally, I'm not always that willing to ask for help. Sometimes you just think, oh, maybe I can, I can do this on my own. So yeah, our goal is that, is it, that independence thing, isn't it, Dory? Well, you know what? And that's what got us so far. And sometimes yeah. that's what gets us staying in our homes. So right. yes. Okay, so next slide. How did we actually get here? How do we how do we reach our goal? So first of all, we describe our program as proactive, reactive, and then proactive again. The proactive part is when we're doing group presentations and home visits. And home visits will offer suggestions on how people might want to modify their home to make it more safe. So notice that it's suggestions and we're not coming in with ultimatums and telling people exactly how they have to do this, but it's suggestions. And then we actually have partnerships where if they have difficulty implementing some of those suggestions and want to implement them, we can give them connections of where they could find that additional help if they, if they needed it. So then it moves to reactive and that's where we actually lift people up off the floor. And then we go proactive again, as soon as the lift is done, then we are once again working to prevent the next fall so that they don't fall again. Um, just a story, I think of, um, no, let's move on. Yeah, we so, just have a couple of minutes left. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we're, we're good. gonna move, yeah. <laughs> so, so then 
we also demonstrate how we get up off the floor. And often that's something that people find very, very empowering. They, um, the uh, people will call me and say, you know what, I tripped over that sidewalk curb and it helped me to get up. And then we can move on to the next slide. So we have some partners, like I said, we have a referral system back and forth with people that we can work together in order to get people the help that we need. And we work really closely with our health authority and about 40% of the people that we lift will actually sign consent so that we can forward their information to the health authority. And then keeping on going, we also have volunteers. So we have our volunteers are mainly retired healthcare professionals and you can imagine they find it very fulfilling. Next slide. So lastly, I wanted to bring it back to where we are and how we are doing with what we say our stated goal is of reducing falls um, or reducing or getting people help, to, the help that they need before we've lifted them five times. You can see that we were doing pretty good and then 2021 hit. It has been such a challenge. And we point most of that to, to COVID. There's a number of factors at play for starters, all of the fall prevention programs in our community have been shut down except remembering when. And even remembering when is done over the phone instead of in person just because of the restrictions and wanting to keep people safe. There's other factors. We, we know that people are often coming home from the hospital sooner than they would have otherwise. And we see that when we do lift assist and that's the people have much more complex medical challenges that they are facing. And so, then, you know, in the past, it was unusual for us to lift somebody more than, than one or two times a week. And that is not becoming unusual at all. It's happening more and more frequently. And then finally, what is the effect of social isolation and loneliness? And does that play a part? So those are some of the factors. So lastly, if you want more about, know more about our program, I'd point you to this article that got published in the Firefighting in Canada about the Saskatoon Remembering Lend Program. And if you'd like to have some specific questions for me, I'm happy to answer them, or we can turn this over. You could, you've got my email address there. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dory. I think it's a really innovative program. It certainly got me thinking about um, engaging firefighters in our community. Dor Dory, I have a question for you. Uh, you are a very uh, pleasant person. You work in community relations and you have made to me, falls and lifts sound like something you know quite pleasant but uh, I my understanding is it's not always a matter of gently picking someone up who's fallen there are real uh, catastrophes that happen from falls uh, in, in fact I can tell just a very short story that a former CARP staffer had had a fall in his home and he passed away and for, as, a, as a direct result of that fall so it's not always a matter of a fire firefighter pleasantly picking someone up can you and I, I really want people to understand the, the real risks inherent with falls. And can you just give us a bit of the, the, the negative side of falling? Yeah. Well, the negatives are huge. Between one and 5% of people who fall will die within the next 14 days. We see that regularly. And I can vouch for that percentage because, you know, you phone people up. And, you know, we're phoning them the next week after they fell just to give them a bit of time and they say, you know, it just happened last week, he, he died within six hours of falling, right? So that is, that is huge. Um, people, falling is not pleasant. Nobody wants it to happen to them. Most of us are popping up as fast as we can to, to avoid the embarrassment. And I can tell you that that embarrassment continues even when you are elderly or older. Um, but what we do when we go in is try to, to um, not you know, try to eliminate that feeling of embarrassment. It's sort of like, okay, this happened, let's make the best of it. And what can we do from now, right? And so we've got different um, things that we do to try to help with that embarrassment. For instance, if somebody's stuck in the bathtub, none of us look good with without clothes on or look better without clothes on than we do with, right? You know, and so just to preserve people's dignity, we'll often go in with a sheet or something like that so that we can cover them up right away before we, we lift them. Um, we try to do this as um, kindly as possible. And I'm always so impressed when our firefighters are described as um, professional and kind. So it's, it, is a, it is a big deal. 
Um, but you know what, once it's happened, let's, let's do our best to, to be kind, to be professional, to help people deal with it the best way they can. Because you know what, the emotional trauma of falling is, is a huge factor to it. Because. And the emotional trauma of having to be picked up is a huge factor. And if we can help people deal with that in a more positive way and move faster to their heal on their healing journey, that's our goal. Does that help? Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I wanted just to, uh, to, to stress the need for getting over that procrastination in, uh, in doing the oh. things necessary to prevent falls because it can very lead to tragic circumstances. So I'm, yeah. going to, I'm going to move on here to Stephanie, just uh, for the sake of time. I think we've got, you know, three hours worth of <laughs> ideas to discuss here. Um, and Stephanie's going to just share a little bit more about the cost of falls in Canada. And we can Thanks, see your, Nancy. your slides. Okay, great. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, I'll, I'll keep this relatively short while still being informative. I see there's so many questions and comments coming in. So thank you all for being so interactive. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely get to, to the Q&A discussion. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cost of falls in Canada. Um, you know, Nancy and Dory have talked a little bit about falls at the individual level, but what's, what's the big picture of falls in Canada, particularly among seniors? Uh, so I work for an organization called Parachute. And we are Canada's national charity dedicated to preventing serious and fatal injuries. And we want all Canadians to have the chance to live a long life, live to the fullest. Uh, there are many causes of injury. So we have a few priority areas that we focus on and fall prevention is one. And I'm sure by the end of my short presentation, you'll understand why that is. Uh, so, Earlier this year, this summer, we released our latest cost of injury in Canada report. Uh, and this is the fourth time we've released a report like this. Uh, and it uh, attempts to quantify in, in monetary terms, economic terms, uh, what the cost of injuries actually is to the healthcare system in Canada and to society. Um, and I mentioned there's lots of different causes of injuries. So in, it is, in addition to falls, this is things like motor vehicle crashes, poisoning, self-harm and suicide, um, all sorts of different ways that, that we may come to serious harm in our lives. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge that the work that we've done has been in collaboration with some important partners. Uh, we, we developed this report with the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit and also in collaboration and with support from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, so let's get into some of the numbers. Uh, well, here you go, the total cost of injury in Canada in a single year is $29.4 billion. Uh, and you'll see on the slide, this is divided into direct and indirect costs. What does that mean? Uh, direct costs are costs to our healthcare system. So that's everything from your ambulance transportation to hospital if needed, the cost of the hospital stay, the physician services, maybe rehabilitation after the injury, uh, just in the first year. Uh, so you'll see that most of the cost is to healthcare, $20.4 billion, again, in a single year, each and every year. Uh, indirect costs, um, thinking about societal level, this is loss of productivity in the workforce and earnings. So people who need to take time off work because of injury or may, who may not return to work after injury. And, you know, these are such big numbers when we kind of break it down, uh, you know, talking about billions. If we break this cost for a healthcare system from injuries down to the day-to-day -day cost, that's $56 million every single day. Um, of our taxpayer money, of our public funds that could be allocated to other needs, particularly needs in our health system. And we've all been living through a pandemic where we see how important those health care system resources are. When we look at what's contributing to these costs, falls are uh, the number one cause by far. And falls actually account for more than a third of the cost. 35% of the total cost of injury comes from falls injuries. $10.3 billion in a single year. And that's for all ages. Uh, when we focus in on falls among seniors age 65 and older, the cost is $5.6 billion a year. And you'll see in the image on the slide just meant to show you 
you know, how much larger that is than every other possible cause of injury among seniors, how much more falls contribute to costs to our healthcare system. And as Nancy has already mentioned, the issue is increasing, the cost of falls is increasing, and it's increasing faster and by more in the 85 and older age group, which, which is a concern. You know, I mentioned the focus of this report is to, you know, have a way to communicate about the economic cost of injuries, including falls. And that information is an important tool for us to have. Decision makers and some others, money, money does make a difference. It makes an impact. So having that information of cost is important for us to be able to advocate for change and point out why this is such a big issue to our decision makers, to our governments and others. Uh, but we don't want to lose the human cost aspect of this uh, because each and every one of these numbers is actually a person with a family, with a community, um, and who's cared for uh, by amazing nurses like Nancy and uh, first responders like Dory. And it, it has such a ripple effect, such an impact. But let's look at just the massive size of these numbers in a single year. Almost 5,000 seniors die every year in Canada because of a fall. More than 94,000 are hospitalized, meaning there's, there's a serious enough injury that they need to be admitted to hospital. Um, and a lot of times that hospital admission leads to um, moving into long-term care rather than returning home. And more than 400,000 emergency department visits. Um, I've included a, a chart image on this page, and I know that the print is very small, um, and that's okay. I, I don't intend for you to be able to see those numbers. What I want you to see is how those bars on the chart are getting bigger as age increases. So um, just, the, no, just the, a couple more minutes, just so you know. Yep, yeah, thanks. Um, so as age increases, the number of hospitalizations, deaths, and emergency visits increase. So again, really seeing that increase with age and that being a concern. Uh, so what do I want you to take away from uh, this little bit of data that I've shared with you? Uh, so falls among seniors have an immense human and economic cost in Canada. As I mentioned, almost 5,000 lives lost per year, $5.6 billion cost to the economy, to the healthcare system. But the problem is that these um, these are preventable. These costs are unacceptable. Falling is not an acceptable part of aging. It is preventable. We can make change. Uh, so we shouldn't just accept this. Uh, also, falls are a societal issue. What do I mean by that? Well, falls affect an individual. And individuals can make changes in their lives to prevent falls. Like Dory mentioned a few examples, and Nancy talked about personal risk factors. But when the numbers are this large, we're not just talking about an individual program and making change person by person by person is not an effective way to make change for everyone. So we do need to focus on other ways we can prevent falls societally. Um, the way that we design our homes and communities changes the environment so it's safer uh, and easier and more automatic for people to age well and age at home. Um, putting things in regulation and standards so that they're built into homes, so the individual doesn't have to choose to install them, for example. And also providing services in homes, um, helping support people to exercise and connect with others, all these things that support healthy aging. Uh, so with that, I do want to mention that if you're interested in more information about this, you can access the full report on our website at parachute.ca as well. We have lots of resources about fall prevention there as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Um, I think really important information. We're all taxpayers and with increasing costs, um, it's a concern for all of us. I'm going to go right on to the next section because we've got people asking for, uh, well, how yeah, do we this some, some very impatient viewers, I'm afraid. Oh. But the, the, the long and the short of their questions is that the folks who have tuned in are closely connected, I think, to falls right now. They're either worried about it themselves. They've got friends, and family, loved ones who uh, have experienced a fall. They're looking for the practical solutions. Exactly. So let me move on if my slides will move on for me. <laughs> this is always when there's a little awkward pause. Uh, and I have been answering questions actually in the Q&A. So uh, hopefully that, that, that helps. And Dory, I saw some questions in the Q&A that were specifically for you. So hopefully you can uh, answer those. My 
PowerPoint is not cooperating here. Let me just try stopping to share again and I'll try it again and see if this will work instead. I'm gonna have to just go down to the right one. Okay, here we are. All right. Um, so good news, we can reduce our risk of falls and here's a mnemonic to, to help. Teeth, that's feet spelled backwards. So tell, exercise, environment, footwear and footing. I'm not gonna take the risk of changing this to slideshow because I'm afraid it will <laughs> lock me out. So tell, even if you're not injured in a fall, um, it's a good idea to tell your health professional. There may be other personal uh, risk factors that have changed for you, some subtle change in your health status you're not even aware of, uh, and there may be environmental risk factors that can be modified. Um, we want to prevent future falls, so it's important to sort of dissect what's gone on in a fall that has happened. And if you're in a public area where a fall occurs, then report it. Um, municipalities rely on those kinds of reports to fix problems like cracks in sidewalks, curbs that have broken apart, um, all sorts of uh, issues with stairs and so on. Uh, and there's probably a number where you can call your municipality or it may be the property owner. So uh, the president of our chapter told the story last week in a, in a webinar, um, he was talking about a big tumble he took, fortunately, without injuries on stairs coming out of a major retail store. And somebody from the store came out to assist because he'd really taken a bad fall um, and said, oh, you're not the first one. Lots of people seem to fall here. So obviously they're not doing something to rectify it, but we they, people need to know when a fall occurs so something can be done. Exercise, the E, a Y. Um, because appropriate exercise reduces the risk of falls and it can be beneficial for adults of all ages and um, all levels of activity. We need exercises specifically that improve strength and balance. It's important to use the appropriate assistive device that you need to help you exercise safely. That can be something as simple as doing a chair exercise, doing it from a chair rather than doing it standing. Um, and you might want to consider wearing hip protectors, especially if you have uh, osteoporosis. We know a lot from research about what kinds of exercise works. And we also know that exercise can reduce your risk of falls by 19 to 34%, which is really quite a bit. Um, strength and balance exercises like lifting light weights or maybe using resistance bands, Tai Chi and squats would be my number one pick from this list. There's other things that are useful too, but those have the most um, proven uh, effectiveness. I think as uh, Dory was mentioning, you know, finding exercise programs, certainly in-person ones has really been a challenge during COVID. Most of them have just stopped, uh, but there's many options um, available on Zoom, although we're all a bit Zoom <laughs> fatigued, I think. Tai Chi um, is a really important form of exercise. And if you just think about Tai Chi movements, they're slow, they're controlled, they require shifting balance. And so it is probably one of the most effective exercises that's available. And it doesn't require a lot of endurance in terms of, you know, um, can you run on the spot or any of that. Squats, important. Um, even if you, um, you know, have to use armrests on your chair, that's, that's fine. And you may have to work up to 15 squats twice a day, but that's generally what's recommended. Hip protectors, I'll just speak about this very briefly. You can think about these as being like helmets for hips. Basically, you wear them in a stretchy underwear, usually, um, that is specifically to hold those hip protectors. They sit right over your hip, as you can see in the photo. And when, if you fall and you fall on that hip, it diffuses the force. So rather than the force being a point force right on your hip, which causes a fracture, it diffuses that force and a fracture is less likely to occur. About 50% less likely to occur. So it's a significant protection it can provide. One of the problems with these um, is that they involve usually some sort of stretchy underwear, as you can see on the right. And for those who have maybe a bit of urge incontinence, that can be a bit of a challenge to get your drawers dropped when you need to go to the bathroom quickly enough. But there's new um, options coming out like um, on the left here with um, 
uh, a set of sweatpants in which the hip protectors can be inserted and are held in place. Uh, my best form of exercise for me is, you know, get, getting outside because I love the outdoors. Um, and I think in Canada, we're often blessed with many walking paths and bike trails. Uh, in BC, there's some really interesting examples through your parks and rec where they've actually put in exercise equipment in many parks. And there's one that's specifically called Tai Chi wheels to help you uh, through Tai Chi movement. So there's a lot we can learn from each other about uh, forms of exercise that might work. But there's a lot of barriers to exercise for older adults. Um, and I'll just uh, maybe mention a couple of these. Um, problems with benches and resting points, problems with the lack of public washrooms. Uh, these are photos I took this summer. This in the upper left is our new standard for benches. It's a good one. It's high enough that it's easy to get off. There's armrests to hold on to. But the river um, pathway that I'm usually on has the old form of benches, and those are very hard to get out of. Uh, so it takes a while to get everything replaced with new standards. We had a big porta potty debate going on in the campaign in our city this uh, fall because people were saying we need latrines, porta potty, something when we're out walking. Um, so they put in some and then they lock them up on weekdays and open them up for weekends. So uh, we've got to bring these kinds of issues to the awareness of our um, parks and rec people at municipal levels. The second E in TIF is the environment. Um, we know that falls on bathrooms in bathrooms and on stairs are much more likely to cause injuries than falls in other locations. It's like 65% for stair and bathroom falls compared to 25% for stairs in other locations. So I'm going to focus on bathrooms and stairs. Um, we know that there's many benefits to home modifications. These slides are all available by the way. So I'm gonna race through a few of them. Um, and specifically, if I had to you know, bet on this and where I put my money, I put my money on installing grab bars and bathtubs and showers and installing better handrails. But there's other things that can be done too. And there's some suggestions as you can see on this slide. We know again from really good research that's been done that funding for home modif modifications work. This study is from New Zealand, but we have evidence from the UK, from the US that we get a reduction of about 40% in injuries related to specific home modifications. It's very cost effective to do this. So grab bars. Well, we have a lot of research going on in Canada that's actually tested what it is about grab bars that makes them work and do they actually work? We know that for bathtubs with or without showers, you need two grab bars, a vertical one to help you get in and out of the tub, and a diagonal one to help you sit down and stand up. Standalone showers need at least a vertical bar. And then there's a lot of specifics about how long, exactly where it should be located, make sure it's put into studs so that it can hold weight, that it needs to be slip resistant and so on. Um, there's still a lot of pushback on grab bars, I think. You know, it goes back to Henry Ford. If we'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, not new cars. Same thing with grab bars. And there's sort of this notion we have that somehow they're institutional in look, but there's many options available. Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad examples of bathroom grab bars. So these two grab bars are okay, but they're not adequate because one is just vertical and one is only the diagonal. And it's not one or the other, you actually need both. Here's examples from some advertising. These are advertised as safe tubs, grab bars. Well, that grab bar is not graspable. It's so small. Even my non-arthritic fingers can't grasp hold of that. And it would only help you maybe swivel around on the seat. It's not gonna help you safely get in and out of that tub. We have a lot of manufactured tubs being advertised. They look great, they look clean, not a sign of a grab bar in them. And you void your warranty if you try to put the grab bar in those yourself. Here's a good uh, looking um, shower, nice L-shaped bath, uh, bath grab bar or shower grab bar, but there's actually no vertical grab bar to get in and there's a lip to step over. So that's a fall waiting to happen. Uh, here's um, mixed advertising. This is um, an advertisement specifically about people living with disabilities. 
They've got an easy to step into tub, a bath seat, not a grab bar in sight. These are on the market. I do not recommend them. Suction cups, um, we know of many examples of falls that have happened with the suction not holding. Uh, and this one, which may be useful for temporary, temporary purposes, you're likely to trip over it as you get in and out of the tub. So getting it right. Well, uh, there's tension mounted security poles, which may be um, your, your choice uh, or something that's properly installed. Uh, and the cost often is not prohibitive. This is a friend who, who installed and purchased and installed her grab bars for $240. She was having hip replacement surgery. This is another friend who had more extensive renovations done um, because they wanted the bathtub actually taken out of the home to give them space for a, a wheel in um, a bath uh, shower area. And you can see there's actually grab bars all over um, each of these things that you see is a grab bar, including the towel rack, including the uh, toilet paper holder. So she is much more comfortable showering now. And there's information out there on how to properly install grab bars uh, and what you need. So I would urge you to get that kind of information if you're getting a renovator. Let me move on to stairs. Um, we know that over half of Canadians have difficulty climbing stairs and they're a leading reason for people to move from their homes. But if you ask people what makes stairs difficult to use or what caused a fall on a stair, most of them will say, well, I was being careless. I don't see so well anymore. They'll blame it on themselves. And it's often the environment. So we've got to kind of turn that around. Um, I'm just going to talk about stairs for a second. And I'm going to mention newel posts. Um, you can see them here. And what a tread is, that's where you step, and a riser, which is the height of the stair. So how do these stairs measure up against recommended safety standards? Well, not very well. Handrails, you have to cross over from one side of the stairs to the other on the left. High stairs, those are difficult to navigate, they're steep. Stairs on the right, well, those ones have open risers and all sorts of light coming in, which can be a distraction, especially during the day, uh, and a handrail that doesn't actually go down to the um, bottom of the last step. And that's a very common problem with handrails. Here's basement stairs. They're often problematic. Even if the upper stairs are good, the basement stairs may be a problem because the same building codes did not cover basement stairs for many, many years. There's a safety hint for you. A seven inch rise should be the maximum and an 11 inch tread, what you step on should be the minimum. This is a handrail, but it's basically useless. Here's somebody doing good volunteer work with Meals on Wheels. Imagine navigating those stairs that's a fall waiting to happen, even though she's doing good work. This is my neighborhood. I've counted the 106 bungalows on my block. Um, and most people have had extensive uh, and expensive work done on their front steps. Uh, but we have the majority with non-uniform stairs, which we can see on the right here. The stairs are not even. That's a fall hazard waiting to happen. We have only five people in my neighborhood who have handrails on their stairs and they're mainly inadequate such as this one on the left here, which is a home of an elderly man who's quite frail and the handrails don't cover the entire stairs and steps he has to go down. And even when we see show-stopping looks, there may be many lurking stair hazards like these with uh, in the middle here with um, the handrail stopping essentially on the third step from the bottom. So these are very common handrail design problems. And I'll just show you a few examples. Discontinuities, no handrail on the landing. You have to lift up. What if you've got a heart condition and you need to catch your breath on that landing? Then you're left without anything to hold on to. How about this? Well, here we go on the right again, another handle stair handrail that stops before you get to the bottom. On the left, a square handrail. Our grip in our hands is not square, it's round. So you don't get a good power grip with that. Here's a municipality that's obviously been called upon to um, fix a problem. And we see that they this tiny step 
um, has probably caused a lot of injuries. So they have used contrast painting, installed a huge handrail to make it evident that it's there. So it's not always the long staircases that are the only problem. And here's much better handrails that actually give you tactile cues about when the, you're at the top of the stair and when you're at the bottom. And if you're not gonna make changes for yourself, then you might wanna think for your family members. I have a new grandson um, and my stair handrails are plank. I can't get a power grip on them. And when I'm holding him, that's a really bad handrail for me to use. So I'm gonna make changes because of him. So the final F uh, in teeth, footwear, uh, we have to navigate four seasons here in Canada. You need to think about indoor and outdoor footwear. It should fit comfortably and snugly. Winter treads are certainly a consideration um, and not all treads that look like they're good ones are actually providing you with the friction that you need. So properly equip your boots, properly equip your Nordic poles so that you've got the right tip or rubber tip on it for the right conditions and think about assistive devices that might help you out. There's um, a webinar we did last year with some hints on um, how to safely put on and take off traction aids. And there's a Rate My Treads website you may find useful where they're doing the research on how to actually uh, find treads and they have a snowflake rating for treads that give better friction. So I'm conscious of the time um, and I'm not gonna be able to get through all my slides, but these are the things that we're working on here in uh, CARP's Ottawa chapter. We'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in fall prevention. We really hope that some other chapters will join us in our efforts to um, try to achieve these goals. Um, and that leaves us with just a few minutes, I think, for some additional questions. Thank you. I'll unshare. So Anthony, have you been keeping track of the questions there? Are there any that? Uh, there's, there's, there's lots of questions uh, on the, the important issue of stairs uh, indoors and outdoors. F members are familiar with the issues, but how do they go about solving them? Who do they call? What's the best advice for actually investing and getting those done? For stairs um, or, and for installing bathroom grab bars too, you're Both, going yeah. to need a, a contractor or a renovator. Uh, so I would, um, you know, especially if you're having some difficulty, I would uh, look for somebody who actually works with a team, um, including an occupational therapist. I would try to identify somebody who has got a certification in building for aging at home. And I would just have some basic questions to ask them. Um, and outdoor stairs are my big concern right now because I just see so many examples all around the city of people who've had all this work done, paid thousands of dollars, I think, for it. And they're left with non-uniform stairs, inadequate treads, terrible shapes, no handrails. So there's some basic questions, I think, that we need to be asking some of our outdoor contractors to make sure that the work gets done properly. So an occupational therapist uh, would be a good resource. Uh, sometimes it's a long wait for that type of assessment. But the, the contractors themselves, uh, there's also uh, often wait lists for, the, for their services. So again, the procrastination, uh, not waiting until you have an acute issue, but taking care of these things now before you actually uh, need them. That's right. And actually, that's one of the reasons that I really advocate for the, the grab bars and the handrails, because, you know, among sort of a more significant structural fixes, those are the, the easiest ones, the most straightforward ones to, to make. But I think we have to get the message out to our suppliers, our retailers, our advertisers, and so on, on getting the right information out to consumers um, about the need for uh, some of these changes when they have to be made, made properly. A big and growing market, for sure. Yes. Stephanie, on, on your presentation, you, you mentioned the importance of social change to help address you know, these costs and, and these, uh, these injuries. Uh, what would you recommend uh, those viewing today do uh, to, to help move the policy changes that are necessary? Yeah, I, I think finding opportunities to, to raise your voice in your community, whether that's through your CARP chapter or uh, through personal involvement. Nancy uh, recommended some ideas herself. Um, are there areas that are unsafe for walking in your neighborhood? Are, is there broken equipment? Um, you know, just opportunities to 
uh, go to your representatives and have your voice heard that this is an issue that matters to you and, and change is needed. And, and Dory, I saw a question re relating to uh, firefighters attending for a lift versus uh, a paramedic or an EMS. And, and just the, the efficiency of such a system, the, it, it seems uh, an expensive municipal cost to be sending uh, professional firefighters to help someone off the floor. Um, well, in, in our community, the, the ambulance is actually private and the, the huh. fire department is public. And so if the fire department comes to, to lift you, there's not a cost associated with it. And if the ambulance does, then there is a cost associated with it. So that often plays into people's consideration. Also, we find that a you know, some of the time when the ambulances come, they still call for the fire department to come because they need the strength um, oh. to, to be able to get them up. And we'll lift people with two, three, four um, firefighters sometimes because there's there's people out there that are, are larger and uh, require a lot of effort to, to lift. The other thing is a response time. And in Saskatoon, our fire department uh, response has a four minute response time for anywhere in Saskatoon and the ambulances is 10. So um, there, there's also that that plays, plays a factor in, in helping people. Um, so we... I mean, it is a cost for the firefighters to, to show up, but that's a cost that's there anyways. And so this is an added service that we can provide for our community. And there was another question, Dory, regarding uh, actually how folks get up off the floor if they think they're able to on their own. Uh, I shared some a link from BC Health, but do you have another resource you'd recommend for people seeing that um, video? Yeah, I have I have a video that we we made to to demonstrate how to do it, and we actually use the one from Public Health Canada. So there's there's um, a brochure from Public Health Canada that just basically shows people how to do it. One of the keys is that you lift up one arm if you're lying on the floor. You lift up one arm and one knee, and that allows you to roll over. And then once you're rolling over, you're you're going to crawl to some place in order to be able to get to a sturdy chair or or a bed. So um, a lot of times if people are just lying on their back and they don't lift up a knee and an arm, they, they don't have the core strength to roll themselves over. But if you do that, you will roll over much easier. So, so that's one of the techniques that is, is key to getting up off the floor. Well, great. We will share that video with the link to this, this, this presentation. Uh, everyone who's registered will get a link uh, to re-watch this video and we'll include that link to uh, the tips for, for getting off off the ground as well. And, and then, can, we save all the can we send all the slides out to everybody? Uh, yes, well? of course. Uh, the slides Perfect. can be, can be shared if you're willing to do that. Uh, yes. They could, they could watch them on video and press pause. If, if, if yes, maybe. yes. I went a bit fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the other qu last question for you, perhaps Nancy is on the advocacy front, there are some tax credits available. There are some uh, some local programs, but it's not universal. What what should we be asking our municipal, provincial, and federal politicians to look for uh, when they're making policies that will help to cut down the costs of hospitalizations and the tragedies of the deaths? Well, I would uh, say one is um, urge our uh, politicians and policymakers at various levels to put in place. Uh, long-term uh, home modification programs that provide funding for adaptation uh, to more accessible homes, uh, including um, funding for landlords who want to make changes in apartment buildings. Um, so I think that's extremely important. Some of those are administered provincially, some federally, some provincially. So we need to tackle all levels of government. Um, so I would say that's probably number one, but uh, something we haven't covered really at all is building codes. Maybe that's another webinar, Anthony, for another day, um, but we have um, legislation for building codes are made at the provincial level. The recommendations come from the federal level, and those building codes and legislative changes will be happening next year. It's a five-year cycle. And I could um, actually provide a lot of suggestions on how people can get engaged with that. And I don't think it's a difficult argument to make when you see the numbers that Stephanie and Parachute presented on the investment in the prevention would, would lead to significant savings well beyond the costs of, of the uh, helping people to, to have the changes made in their own homes or in their surroundings. 
Absolutely. We have very good data on the cost effectiveness of grab bars, the cost effectiveness of home modification programs. Um, they, they more than pay for themselves with the reduction in hospitalizations. When I looked at the number of deaths uh, that Stephanie reported and the number of hospitalizations and ER visits and the related cost, I thought that with uh, being in the middle of a pandemic and the response that we had to tragic deaths and the threat of, of uh, deaths and hospitalizations that uh, I think looking through the lens of how we've reacted to COVID, this may be something to consider how we react to, to a big issue like falls when it might not be uh, on top of mind of policymakers, but the numbers are, are really relevant. Stephanie, you think that makes sense through COVID's lens? Absolutely. And you know, we've seen great responses to COVID, the investment both in getting funds to people, investment in our infrastructure, uh, the level of investment, given the size of the falls problem from our from our government, does not match, to, to be quite frank, and, and that needs to change. So a call to action for everyone listening uh, who's, who's tuned in and who will perhaps watch this video later. It's, it's time to call your, your local councillors, your, your local MLAs, MNAs, MPPs, as well as your federal MPPs, and let them know that you've uh, been educated today and you think that there's a a definite need for improvement in this in this area and Nove november is a great time to do that so let's give you a an agenda to all the watchers to by the end of the month uh, call one at least one of those uh, political representatives and let them know that you think investment in fall prevention is a worthy cause for your tax dollars all right uh, nancy anything to add before we wrap up no, I don't think so. Other than we just we just love to hear from CARP members and CARP chapters who are interested in any aspect of fall prevention. Uh, if we work together on this, I think we can really make um, a dent in the problem. So, but I think we've got to work together on it as opposed to working singly. So, thank you very much for joining us and for the opportunity to uh, share some ideas. And we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Stephanie and Dory in particular for joining us. Thank you all, and thank you to everyone who, who came in as a participant. We very much appreciate your interest, and we hope you'll take some action, uh, and uh, not for not only for yourselves, but for the, uh, the the larger social issues. So, thanks again, everyone. Uh, look forward to seeing you again at a future CARP National Webinar.